great weather, and thank you for being with me tonight. We are sold out, completely oversold, booked, packed. It's wonderful to have everybody here with such great energy. My name is Elizabeth Alfano, and you are at the dinner party. I invite three celebrities and a known chef who cooks for us, and over food and wine and chocolate and performances, the conversations flow. But the great thing about it is that our wonderful chef tonight, Carrie Nahabedian of Brandy and Naha, she's also cooking for you, and you're part of the conversation. We have a fabulous lineup. It's very exciting. My first guest really needs no introduction. Everybody here knows him. Everybody who's watching us from coast to coast knows him. He is restaurateur extraordinaire. He is a chef like there is no other. He is a wonderful per TV personality and a great humanitarian. Please welcome Rick Bayless. Yeah. Come on out, Rick Thank Bayless. Thank you so much. Rick Bayless sitting right Thank there. You. Hello, everyone. Rick Bayless is in the house. That's an awful lot of fun. Okay, our next guest, she is a New York Times best-selling author. Please welcome international writer Sarah Paretsky. Not too shabby. <laughs> we have not yet even started drinking. <laughs> and of course we have New Yorker cartoonist, author, and funny man himself, Pat Burns joining us. Woo! Before I talk to you about what you have in common, it's hard for me to focus on you when I know that there's great food coming our way. So let's take a peek into the Naha and Brandy kitchen and see what Carrie Nahabedian is making for our appetizers. Hi, my name's Carrie Nahabedian. Many of you know me from Naha, but we're filming here today in our new restaurant, Brandy. Tonight we're starting the evening with a winter soup of chestnut and celery root and it's scented with scotch and whiskey because chestnuts love whiskey and it's finished with a little cream infused with coffee and it'll get you started to, it'll warm you up for this long winter nights. So we're starting with a white, as we say a white mirepoix, a little bit of celery, leek, and we're doing a little sweating of it. A sweat means to cook without browning. Cook it in whole butter, of course season it with salt, cracked black pepper, we use kosher salt. Then we're gonna have shelled, peeled, raw chestnuts. If you're scared, don't be scared of a chestnut. You can get them in the store, you can buy um, individual already peeled chestnuts just don't buy them in ju uh, candied in, in liquid because it, you'll, you'll suddenly be making dessert instead of soup. Then we have some beautiful celery root. You can see all the vegetables are sweating. And then we're gonna add some alcohol. We're putting a little touch of uh, scotch. And always with alcohol, make sure that your flame is low so all of a sudden you don't have a flame out. So now we're gonna add Nice hot chicken stock. The trick to making soup is, is that you don't want to do all these beautiful steps and then use so much stock that you now lose the flavor. So we have a beautiful chicken stock that we've now reduced to get maximum flavor. We bring this up to a boil and we simmer it. We cook until the chestnuts are tender and until the celery root is absolutely perfectly cooked. So now we have heavy whipping cream. Don't make it with milk, skim milk, half and half. It doesn't stand a chance of breaking because we have so much liquid in there. One of the, the highlights of this soup is that we infuse cream with coffee beans. So we're just doing a little straining. So we're gonna start to whip it. So remember, cream and alcohol they need to be incorporated. Too much alcohol, it'll just turn to a mess and you can't bring it back. So you just want to get that beautiful flavor into the dish. Nice soft peaks, holds in the bowl. So now we're gonna, now we're gonna garnish the bowl. 
I like to make a little uh, ring of cream. This is so that you have flavor in every single bite. So now we're gonna do a little garnish of the pear. Small little rings of poached celery that we julienne very fine. Now if you're feeling really indulgent, you would use shaved truffles, foie gras, confit duck. You can do anything that you'd like. So then, small little bits of torn celery leaves. My mother uses celery leaves in, in just the regular family salad, just like she tears parsley. My mother's a really great cook. That's where I learned a lot of uh, the passion that I have because every meal that she made for us growing up, she had her whole heart and soul into it. Okay, so you have a nice little ring going. Then we're gonna take the caramelized wild rice and you're just gonna crush it. So you have the creaminess, the crunch, the fragrance. So start around the edges. The reason why you pour it like this because when, we, when you pour the bowl, it rises up like a raft. So there you have it. Winter soup of roasted chestnut and celery root with a creme de cafe with puffed wild rice and basque pear. Enjoy. Carrie is still um, wickedly plating in the, in the kitchen, so she's going to be out with us in a minute. What was the first dish that had an impact on you that made you want to create? Oh, that's a really good one. Um, I grew up in a restaurant family, so I had food around me all the time. My grandmother was an amazing cook, um, and she did the, the opposite of the restaurant food. She did the food that you just wanted to hang out at her table, and it was a um, soul-satisfying, heartwarming kind of food. And I don't know if... Um, I don't know if this is the first dish exactly that had a big impact on me, but it's one that always has had and continues to have, and that's peach cobbler. Really? So I um, this is that. a peach cobbler in our family was more than just a dish that came to the table because um, all the grandkids would get together and we would go with our grandmother to a peach orchard and we would harvest all of the peaches from this peach orchard. Where was this? And this is in Oklahoma City. I grew oh, up in Oklahoma oh, City. Oh, so um, we have one person from <laughs> Oklahoma City. So yes, uh, here she is. Thank you very much. Yes, uh -huh. um, and we would, we would drive south to Paul's Valley, which was completely covered with all these peach orchards. And we would harvest them. And it was really fun. But the most dramatic part of the whole experience was coming back in my grandmother's fish tail Cadillac um, with all those peaches and seven grandchildren in the car. And it, it smelled so intensely of peaches. And then for the next three days after that, we canned the peaches, we made them into peach butter, pickled peaches, all different kinds of preparations that then became the base of every Every time that the big family got together, we would eat peach cobbler. So I would say that that still resonates with me as probably the most dramatic experience I've ever had as a kid with food. Because of the mm. emotional connection. It was. Yeah. It was yes. all of and that stuff. It, it's, yeah. it, it meant something. And it was, it was the emblem of our family yeah. that we all got together and we yeah. ate peach cobbler for every big occasion. Well, Lovely. things have changed a little bit for you. So you've gone from peach cobbler to Oaxaca. Maybe we can take a peek at season nine, what's going on in Mexico.
agree with a lot of people who think of Oaxaca as the epicenter of the food world here in Mexico. And in the over 30 years that I've been coming here, I've seen quite an evolution. I, I would say that the most exciting part of that evolution for me is all these young chefs who are totally in love with the traditional cuisine. They're adopting it, adapting it, and evolving it into some of the most contemporary cuisine that you'll find anywhere. Their kitchens are just filled with passionate, skilled young cooks. And though Oaxaca is a sort of smallish town, these restaurants can hold their own with some of the best restaurants in the world. This is Dan Santes. It's known for an amazing design and a very progressive bar and signature mezcal program. But the real appeal for me is the fabulous menu that's created by Chef Miguel Angel Jimenez. And he's now working on season 10, which is such an amazing feat. I wanted to pick up with Sarah because you also, you know, created such an iconic figure in V.I. Warshawski. So what impresses me with what you do is, I'm going to read you something from V.I. Warshawski's horoscope. <laughs> so, um, you have researched your character so much that you've actually written a horoscope for her, and it goes like this. Vianna Roshofsky was born on July 27th with the sun in Leo and Gemini rising. Her chart reads, extremely active by nature. You like to get around and meet people. Very restless. You can't seem to stay put. Because of the high nervous tension you always have, your athletic activity would be a good way for you to burn off energy. So I want to talk to you about how you research your stories and your books, because this is so incredibly detailed that you know she has a Gemini rising. Well, is it I, true? <laughs> it's true that I researched her horoscope, okay. and, and that's what they said in the online horoscope site that I consulted. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I thought it was so... The on, curtain falls. What I'm really impressed with is the level of detail that Elizabeth brought to this, because this is buried in the FAQs on my website, VI's Horoscope. So thank you for digging deep. I think my favorite, the, my favorite, re well, two things that I did for the books that were really great fun. Uh, for the, my second book, Deadlock, which is set in the Great Lakes shipping industry, I actually rode an ore ship from Thunder Bay oh. uh, in, in uh, just on the western edge of Lake Superior in Canada to the Welland Canal. And I, you know, I was still working full time downtown then. I didn't have a lot of money. I had $600 in my bank account. They gave me the run of the ship. It was really wonderful, and mm. and uh, put me up in the stateroom where the last person in it had been head of the Canada Grain Commission. And I kept thinking, <laughs> what is this going to cost? And can I kite a check or you know? Like, <laughs> And finally, my last day on board, just as we reached Niagara Falls, and I said to the captain, no one has said anything as vulgar as money, but um, what does this cost? And he said, oh, we can't charge you. Then we'd have to advertise as a passenger ship. Oh. So, uh, so I had this wonderful Great Lakes sea voyage. So do you try to do everything that's in your book? Because you have 17 books now, isn't that right? probably work on your 18th, so do you try to do everything that you've written? I, well, hmm, I, a lot of it I imagine. I like strangled when, a longshoreman <laughs> once just to see how long it took. Like me, I <laughs> jumps from a gantry into the sanitary canal. No, I didn't try that. Do that okay. one, yes. Just, but the book that I'm working on, I'm hoping to set a scene in the tunnels underneath Wrigley Field, and I will, I do have somebody who, if it ever Got a guy. thaws, Right. right, if you can, right. If uh, it's going to take me down there and let me, let me see where you could put a body. <laughs> or, or the entire starting roster, really. Yeah. <laughs> Does everybody know how VI was created? This is a great little story. I have a, a video clip of when I interviewed Sarah a couple of years back and she told me the story. Let's see if we can roll that short clip. I was uh, working for CNA Insurance in downtown Chicago, and we were in a meeting, and my lips were saying, oh, Fred, heck of an idea, and the balloon over my head was saying something unprintable. And really, literally, in that moment, looking down at the dead trees in Grant Park, VI came to me. I, I thought, I don't want, like, 
you know, a male detective in drag. I want a woman who's like me and my friends. She's doing the job that didn't exist when we were in high school. But she's saying what's in the balloon over her head because she doesn't worry about what they think of her or getting fired. And that is true. I was, I was thinking private thoughts on company time. <laughs> what is the effect that your work has had or you hope to see it have? I think that partly my, my writing, creating this woman character, and partly the work that I did in creating the advocacy group Sisters in Crime has made it easier for women to see themselves in books, see themselves as writers. I hope that the work that I do in the community through some of the foundation work that I do also makes children of both sexes who feel marginalized feel more empowered to take chances in their lives. One of my absolute favorites is a group called Girls in the Game, which does sports with girls where they really, uh, recess has been eliminated in a lot of right. yes. public schools and, and art programs and art yeah. programs sure. and music programs mm -hmm. and cooking programs yes. and cartoon programs. Yeah, they, they, <laughs> they fall under art, I guess. But that and competition is kind of like a sport in itself, but it's a, it's a blood sport. Which? The, the competition against all the, the part, the, programs that we need that right. are fighting for funding. Well, I mean, joking aside, these are the, this is really the leavening that society needs if, it's, if we're going to thrive as, as a democracy, not rote memorization right. for tests, mm -hmm. but the creative right, work in whatever field. And children should be exposed to creative work in many fields so mm -hmm. that they see what their metier is. I um, actually interviewed, I write for the Huffington Post, and I interviewed five CEOs and or um, large entrepreneurs, and I had asked them if the arts had affected them in any way. Had they had any arts in their upbringing? And, and if so, had they carried that through to their adult lives? And they all said that because of the arts, they felt that they had a competitive advantage in business because it made them original thinkers. And mm -hmm. therefore, they were craftier thinkers, and they wouldn't have oh, had dear. this had they not been exposed to the arts. So, and they all said, and they, and they were different, you know, so one was the banking. the dark side of the arts. <laughs> that any sort of creativity is, is really just solving a problem. Like, you know, how do mm -hmm. I get this toilet paper off my mm -hmm. shoe without people laughing at me? How, you know, <laughs> that's a problem, that, but that's what you have often. Figure it out. Right. And you find, you find people will be tremendously creative right. in a situation like that. I, I think it's very important that people recognize today in the modern world that when you say you want to be professional, and I run into this all the time in big meetings that everybody thinks that they have to be buttoned down and nobody can joke, nobody can sort of spin ideas to me. If you want to get anything done, you, it, there has to be humor involved in it at some point. You have to be able to laugh. You have to be able to laugh at yourself because once you start laughing at yourself, yeah. that's when you get right. really creative because the, all the barriers are down. Right. You don't have, you're yes. not protecting anything. And to me, I'm, I, I always bring that to all the meetings that we have at our restaurants. Is I, I just want everybody to laugh, relax, and then get creative. Because when you're laughing at yourself, you're questioning yourself. You're you saying, are. like, well, is this really the best idea? Right. And then you might, that might push you off into something else accidentally. Yes, but it's so true. And accidents are where a lot of the good things really happen. We were that's what we were talking about backstage. Yes, just if you don't let yourself go off road, yes. you're not really going to find that new You're direction. not going to find mm -hmm. the good stuff. Making them have free time, whether it's not structured, that's where creative comes from. Mm -hmm. And I think often when I'm, when I'm stuck in a book, as I almost always am, uh, for days at a time, that I, Richard Feynman, who my my husband, who was yes, taught I, physics at the University of Chicago, was that was his idol among the I love 20th to read century him. physicists. But he discovered something about electron spin, which um, is <coughs> classified, so I can't tell you tonight what it is. <laughs> but he was standing in line at in the uh, Cornell Faculty Club, and he was juggling plates, and which really annoyed a lot of his colleagues. <laughs> Uh, but watching the way the rim the moved, well, you tell this story because you know that uh, he, he, you know, he had been really stressed out all the time. But he started kicking back and he was watching that, and he saw the plates, you know, as they go up and they're just flipping. The kids were just laughing, and, and they were, did this little wobble, and he thought, 
I wonder what the heck causes that wobble. And he started you know, working out the equations. And it was those equations that, that brought him his Nobel Prize. No, but it was, it was playing that made mm -hmm. him start thinking about it. Because he had been working on it for a number of years, and it was the, the play that, that made it happen. But yeah, because it was the play, because he was, it started out the play, and, and then just, you know, cool, he was playing. And then later when he faced a problem, you know, there it was. Because he was always talking about the more different things you try. I mean, we were talking about all the different arts and the cooking and this. You have more tools to put in your toolbox and you have more ways to come at a problem. And that's what creativity is all about. There's a great Steve Jobs quote, and I've said it before on this show. He's always saying that the people he worked with, they weren't necessarily more creative. It's just that they had had more experiences in life. And so they had more dots to connect because they had, mm -hmm. had experienced more things. And so the more just experiences you have in life, the more creative you so can be. So if you're looking to hire the older worker. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, maybe this is a chance, though, to have Sarah read for us a, a bit of your work so that we can all get a sense for what it is that you write. I'm not going to read from VI, and I'm not going to read very long. My, my books are complicated, and setting, I'm only allowed three minutes, so um, <laughs> it would take that long to set up the backstory. I'm going to read from a short story, and because this is a food evening, this is a dinner party. A Taste of Life. I'm going to read just little fragments of it. Daphne Rader worked in the bookkeeping department at Rapilec, Inc. Her capacity for work, her appetite for it, was insatiable. In January, when accountants go mad closing previous year's books, Daphne flourished. Everyone at Rapilec loved Daphne in January. Flowers appeared on her desk and chocolates. In February, these blandishments disappeared and Daphne lived alone behind her barricade of ferns. She was smart, she was willing, she was capable, but she was also very fat. <laughs> Daphne was an excellent cook. She could make elaborate French dinners, including elegantly decorated pastries. Food and wine were so outstanding that her co-workers longed for invitations and would exclaim at their hostess who barely touched her food. How could she be so fat when she scarcely ate? After they left, Daphne would pull another four portions from the oven and devour them. <laughs> Daphne's present condition was sad to those who knew her as an elfin child. What had happened? Family friends blamed her mother, Sylvia, who was a top model. When Daphne was born, Sylvia delighted in the photographs, hovering sentimentally over a white-clad infant only enhanced her popularity. But as Daphne moved from infant seats to kindergarten, she became an encumbrance. If the child was growing up, the mother must be aging. So Sylvia force-fed Daphne and turned her into the fat woman that she is today. However, one day into Daphne's life came a beautiful young accountant, Jerry, and they fell in love, and Daphne lost weight, and they she actually was able to buy clothes in an actual dress shop instead of making them for herself. Sylvia arrived in Chicago and was just furious. Daphne in love, Daphne getting thin, no. So Sylvia seduces the poor unfortunate Jerry away from, from Daphne. And uh, the morning after Jerry hasn't come home for the night, well, Sylvia's courtship of Jerry was long and difficult. She postponed winter plans and stayed in Chicago, hosting parties, making a splash at all the society events, getting Jerry to escort her when Prince Philip hosted a dress ball at the British consulate. <laughs> and then the morning that Jerry hasn't come home all night, Sylvia shows up at the apartment to get his clothes. Buzz off now, Daphne, and finish your cookies, Sylvia snapped, slapping Daphne across the face. Daphne picked up the dressing table lamp and began pounding Sylvia's head with it. <laughs> Sylvia fell against the dressing table, dead long before Daphne stopped screaming and hitting her. Finally, Daphne's rage subsided. She collapsed on the floor by Sylvia's body and began to cry. Jerry would never come back to her. No one would ever love her again. She wanted to die herself, to eat and eat until she was engulfed by food. 
Mechanically, methodically, still weeping, she lifted Sylvia's left arm to her mouth. <laughs> You know, it, it, it's, it's writing and thinking. The writing, I write fast when I know what I'm saying, but a lot of times I will be at my machine for six or eight hours writing five words. Right. And I try, especially because I'm late on my deadline, I, I write genre fiction, which is considered... Uh, Let's not even talk about the annoying state of publishing today for <laughs> genre fiction. Many of my peers, such as Lee Child and Janet Ivanovich, are now writing two or three books a year. And I'm like, I'm behind on my deadline, and I can only write one book every 15 months. So if I could write faster, I would, but I'm a slow thinker. Uh -huh. uh, and so there's a way in which I'm never actually not working but I understand this. Yeah. It's always churning in the back right. of your mind. And I'm not playing enough. And so, because I'm so anxious about the fact that I'm late and I can't solve the problem and is the book a wreck and will everybody hate it? And so all of that gets in my way and slows me down. Well, I was going to ask all of you this question. Do you feel pressure? You're on book 18. You're on season 10. You just did a book and, you know, for The New Yorker, you have cartoon after cartoon after cartoon that has to be funny. Do you worry? Does that pressure get to you that you have to perform? It does. No, never. <laughs> because in a way, you think you but might be used to it by now. We're going to take this knife now, Pat. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, my wife has very uh, delicately referred to me as squirrel head. Uh, <laughs> what? Squirrel brain, Oh, Sorry. she's corrected you. Corrected. It's squirrel brain. Yes, squirrel brain. Because <laughs> uh, I, I, I am constitutionally incapable of doing just one thing. Ah. There's, if, if I, the most dangerous thing in my world is 10 minutes to go, ah. Oh, I don't have anything to do. Wait, I this think we have great. a great comic of him multitasking. Because that is the time where my, I can relax and play. And that's where the next idea comes from. And sure. unfortunately, sometimes those ideas will be things that like, wow, you can think of it like that. But then to execute it, you know, it's like you'll, you'll think of an idea for a book. Great! Then, then, then you writing. Gotta write you got to yeah. write yeah. 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 And, you gotta write that And that's book. where all the work is. And that's, you know, uh, um, I had uh, an idea for something that... Um, I was, it was a cartoon. I was trying to make funny. It was, and I couldn't. It was like, who's this close to funny? It would have been a kind of a, a witty quip at a, a cocktail party, but I just couldn't turn that corner and make it be worth investing 10 minutes to make it a rough that will get rejected, and I could forget about it from there. And then as I'm letting it die, I thought, you know, there's actually a serious idea in there uh -huh. that consumed the next three and a half years of my life. The next three and a half years. And so, and so th the those accidental moments when you're just letting one idea die, you might see it from a different angle, and um, ideas are scary. Because you don't know where it's going to take you. Yeah, they don't know where you're going to take Or when gonna they're going to come. Yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. right. You just have to be open to it all the time. Yeah. And be willing life. to go through, as you could imagine, as you could imagine, just like long dry spells where nothing is happening right. and you still show up. That's the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, the difference between somebody who's successful and somebody who's not successful is that the successful person always shows up. Yes, you I know, mean, Mary Oliver so has something to say about that in her, Mary Oliver, the Pulitzer Prize winning poet, yes. has a handbook on poetry, and she, she says that about the muse. She says, you know, if, if Romeo had come to the, to the window and Juliet wasn't there, you wouldn't have a love story or a tragedy. Right. And the muse, the muse doesn't come if you're not willing to show to up. To show up, right. yes. Okay. And if so I can true. like segue into something more per parental, it, it's like <laughs> quality time. Yeah. Quality time is a function of quantity time. Mm -hmm. You know, people talk about, I have quality time with my kids. No, no you know, it's quantity. Good luck with that, you know. You, yeah. you got to be there for a, a long time until something happens, right. and, uh, and that, oh, that only great. happens as if you're yeah. there enough time. So not I, missing I, the small moments. Well, and I said uh, for me with my daughter that... Um, 
I, I wasn't quite sure exactly how to, to really bond with her, and so we just started making dinner together. Oh. And yeah. that was, it, it was only in the small moments when she was grating the cheese and I was sautéing the whatever, and the stuff would just come out. But it, you couldn't plan it. You couldn't say, okay, let's sit down and have the quality time right. now. Amen. It just had to come, come out normally, naturally, in the small moments. It's interesting that you say that because that's a common thing that you do in improv is they teach yes. you to busy yourself, pretend that you're folding laundry, pretend that you're ironing, pretend that you're chopping carrots. Mm -hmm. And that's when your mind then frees huh. up because you've busied yourself. You're doing something. And so cooking is great right. for that connection time yes. because you're all sort of futzing and then you, your brain starts to go free and you start to connect. Absolutely. Well, I mean, when, how, and why did you decide to focus your art on cartooning? cartoons and I will add to that how do you create a cartoon well first of all I did not decide to be a cartoonist and please eat you everybody. do not go to your high school career day and say like oh, I want <laughs> systems analyst uh, <laughs> biologist uh, cartoonist oh, well, I'll look at the cartooning you don't do that I mean you become a cartoonist because you have to it's a genetic condition <laughs> and you can't you do it because you can't not do, do it. it. You have no choice. Yes, it's, yeah. it's, it's something that, that compels you. Um, it's something that, that is very life-saving in, in a lot of ways. Because, uh, you know those, those, those comments that you uh, w could make that will get you punched in the face? If you don't yes. say them, but instead write them down in a little notebook, that makes you a cartoonist. <laughs> And, and it keeps you alive instead of being that wise ass who got what was coming to him. After that, you just figure out, all right, well, what do I do? And then, well, you take all your little ideas, you draw them up, you make copies, and you, this, this I wish it was more romantic than this. You stuff them in an envelope, you send them somewhere, and you wait. How long is the wait to get into the New Yorker? It could be any length of time. Um, I, I submitted some stuff in college. And it was, it was awful. It was awful, awful. But then, you know, out of college, I, I, I made like two or three submissions like every three or four years. And they were lame. They were awful. I was, it was a week before my 39th birthday. And you got in. I had recently started submitting again. And I turned out a bunch of gags in quick time. I was drawing a lot uh, for a comic strip that I had that was in development. And so I thought, okay, I'm ready now. Uh, so and you felt so that it, took, it was your it took, time. It, yeah, so it was my time. And then, then it happened fairly quickly. But there are guys that, you know, it, they, for me, but, you know, really, it was really uh, close to 20 years. And that's fairly normal for a lot of guys. Is it the caption first and then you draw for it? Or do you have the drawing and then you find the caption? Uh, it's the idea first. Aha. Uh -huh. You're writing a show. You're writing a very, very short show. And so you have to come up with the script. You've you got it. You're the prop master. You're the director, cinematographer. You're everything All in one. for that short little show. Because there's something that, that came before that, and something's happening here, and something's coming after it. And you've got to tell all that story right there. And you know th there there might be relationships involved. Yes, and yes. a lot of it's got to be you know quick and iconic, obviously. Yes. Yes. But there's in that snapshot moment, you're, there's a story. How, how long might something like that come to be? Um, the 40 some years. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it's uh, that ha can happen in, in a moment. I mean, uh, uh, tragically, that, that was probably partly inspired by uh, a retoucher who had taken some iconic uh, picture from uh, uh, Vietnam, which was an execution. And he put, instead of a gun, he put a hair dryer. And it was, it was bleak, it was dark, but it was, you know, for a guy who's a photo retoucher, you go like, well, damn, that's good. But uh, so that, probably, that artifact was probably stuck in the lint trap of my brain. And then um, it was winter. And, and, it and you know, because I use a hair, I have, I, have, I have a hair dryer. Really? <laughs> I have it in my office. It doesn't office. take you too long. Dude. You know, it doesn't. <laughs> Seriously, I, I, I take a towel in my hair. It's, it's combed and dried all in one. And, um, but I have a hair dryer for, for watercolors. 
Because, oh, you know, when oh, you're working on a deadline, you can't sit there and, I'll wait for this wash to dry, and then it'll be beautiful. So no. you blow dry your art. Oh, that's great. i got to keep working. It's due by five. All right, so we're going to hear from Pat in his book. He's going to read from his new book, Captain Dad. Go ahead. Well, should I use this or that? Or which Whatever you would like. Uh, this is from Captain Dad, The Manly Art of Stay-at-Home Parenting. <laughs> Yay. Ask for it by name. And this is from the chapter called, Let's Do Lunch. <coughs> you can eat off the floor in my kitchen. In fact, if you're willing to get down on your hands and knees, you could probably cobble together an entire meal. <laughs> of course, it would consist entirely of crumbs. Yes, crumbs. Crumbs. I spend a ridiculous amount of time sweeping up crumbs, blizzards of them. It doesn't matter what the kids are eating. Bananas. There will be crumbs. Like sawdust at a mill, they fly with every buzz, cut, and nibble. No matter how many times I tell my kids to eat over their plates, if I used a rake instead of a broom, I could create my own zen garden underneath the kitchen table. So I sweep after every meal, after every snack, after every time I just finished sweeping, but someone just had to come back for one more bite of something she hadn't quite finished. Like brunch after the Sermon on the Mount, you'd be astounded at the crumbus fallout. One last little bite can rain on your freshly swept floor. Unless you have kids, that is. Then you know too painfully well. A lazy man might suggest putting it off till the end of the day and sweeping them up all at once. I know because I was that lazy man. <laughs> and you know what I found out? I found out that a truly lazy man will sweep early and often. Because if he doesn't, tiny little feet will ferry those crumbs to every corner <laughs> of the house. Like busy bees pollinating a grove of very flat polyurethane trees. I can't tell you how many times I have found what I thought were maggots in the baby's room. <laughs> only to be relieved that it was only dried rice. <laughs> only to be unrelieved at the subsequent thought of what other natural ant baits were hiding there. So, sweep. Learn to love it. And I do, sort of. Uh, I mean, sweeping does have a zen-like appeal. It's a time I get to send the kids out of the room, shrieking, don't walk in my dirt, just like my mother used to, <laughs> and savor a moment's relative relief from my two little entropy machines, so long as I don't think about the chaos that is going on in the next room while I'm restoring order to the kitchen floor. And nobody got eaten. So Rick and I were talking, we were thinking, well, they're this writers, and they get to read something funny. So Rick has decided to give us a little something-something himself. Okay. So when somebody writes a cookbook, <laughs> they never expect to be standing in front of a couple hundred people reading from their cookbook. <laughs> so tonight, this is a first. <clears throat> I have never read from one of my cookbooks ever. <laughs> in public. I'm going to read for you Watermelon Ginger Guacamole. <laughs> Stir. Scoop the cubed watermelon into a vacuum sealing bag, sprinkle with tequila, and then vacuum seal it. Refrigerated while you make the guacamole. Cut the avocados in half, running the knife around the pit from top to bottom, and then back up again. <laughs> Twist the halves in opposite directions to release the pit from one side of each avocado. Then remove the pit. <laughs> Scoop the flesh from each half into a large bowl with an old-fashioned potato masher, perhaps a large fork, or the back of a large spoon. Yeah. 
coarsely mash that avocado. <laughs> Grate the zest from half of a lime into the avocado. Juice the lime and squeeze two tablespoons of that juice into yes. those avocados. Then finely grate ginger into the avocados. Measure about a half a teaspoon of that grated ginger. Add it to the avocado along with some green chili, some herbs. Stir to combine, then taste and season with salt. <laughs> Cover with plastic wrap, press directly onto the surface of the guacamole and refrigerate it until you're ready to serve. Now, right before carrying that guacamole to your guests, release the vacuum seal <laughs> from the watermelon. Gently stir half, not all, but half of that watermelon into the guacamole. Scoop the mixture into a serving dish and top it with the remaining watermelon. All this talk about food, I think it's time that we check into Carrie's kitchen again and see what she's making for our entrees. Welcome back. Now we're going to finish up with our entree. So for tonight, we've created a dish just for the dinner party, which is a ravioli of the rabbit confit with grain mustard, fins herb, a beautiful carrot puree, and then we're finishing it with a fresh juice carrot broth with hen of the wood mushrooms. So now we're gonna start with the dough. Don't be intimidated. We've made a classic pasta dough. Only work with the amount of dough that you can handle. And once you reach your desired thickness of the dough, you just keep running it through that same number. We're going to egg wash lightly. Don't go crazy with the egg wash. The tendency is to always overstuff. And uh, whether you're making turnovers, strudel, less is more. Make sure that your carrot puree is not too wet. Sometimes late in the winter, the squash or carrots can get a little moisture from the winter storage. Working quickly. You form it, just like that. We're going to make a nice, classic ground ravioli. And now we're going to cook it. So we have a, a, a lot of garnish here. We have some tarragon oil, fresh tarragon blended with olive oil. That's going to enhance the dish. Uh, tarragon leaves, little chervil leaves, chives, red watercress, and pea shoots. We have some pickled mustard seeds, confit garlic. There's no fear of uh, pungency because it's cooked in duck fat. We're gonna add a little ginger, black pepper, nutmeg, and clove. You can add even a little green cardamom to your fresh squeezed carrot juice. So we squeeze our own carrot juice, but if you don't have a juicer, then buy fresh. Uh, carrot juice from your grocery store and then infuse it. We've taken the carrot broth and then we've strained it out and we've infused it with those ingredients. The rabbit confit, that there isn't enough film in the camera to show you how to make a, a confit. So basically, uh, in this beautiful, lovely copper pot, we have the rabbit that has been picked thoroughly. Look how beautiful that is picked and it has a little bit of the duck fat there and that's going to garnish our dish. Here we have flavorful rabbit stock that we're going to cook our raviolis in. Get rid of the myth of plunging your pasta in ice water, plunging, running your pasta in a colander in your sink, running cold water off of it. Because what you're doing is you're getting rid of all the starch, you're getting rid of all the flavor of the pasta. When you cook your pasta, just ravioli is a different scenario because we want that rabbit flavor in it. Save some of your pasta water. 
save a cup or two, and then toss your pasta with your olive oil or your tomato sauce, but add some of the pasta water to it because you're adding more flavor into it. Just coat them with a little bit of oil so they don't stick to each other. So we're gonna start the plates. Once you've chosen your bowl, you're gonna do a little carrot puree on the bottom just to anchor, just to anchor the ravioli. Place your ravioli in the bowl. A little dab of the uh, confit rabbit, just as an extra bonus. Put the Hen of the Woods mushroom as a little bouquet. We're gonna sauce with the fresh carrot broth. A little salad of watercress, shaved red radish, and pea shoot for that little touch of spring. A ravioli of rillette of rabbit with carrot puree, roasted hen of the woods mushrooms, confit rabbit, freshly juiced carrot broth, and a salad of pea shoots and radish. Hope you enjoyed the dinner party. I'm Carrie Nahabedian from Brondi and Naha Restaurant. Come join us, have a seat. That was great. Um, get this woman a glass of wine, please. Yes, get this woman a glass of wine. Let's make her some room. How do you think playtime and creativity are impacted by technology? Um, and you took your my, so I can't eat chocolate. My daughter was asking me on the way home from school today, yeah, but you know, because you know, other kids at school, they get a lot more computer time. Uh huh. Yes, other kids get a lot more computer and time. And I thought, well, that would make an interesting, an interesting experiment. Let's take their test scores. Uh -oh. And, and, and we'll, 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 we'll grid them, put them on a grid, but their test scores correlated to computer time. And so, you know, quit complaining about you know, not getting enough time on the computer. Oh, because so, their, their test scores were lower. Yeah, because right, she does well because, she because you know, we don't let her be on the computer, so she has to do that crazy thing called uh, reading. I see, I and see. And so she's learned to love books. And woo, 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 yeah. woo. <laughs> the paper kind too. Woo. We, so, we, we no. don't do any of that. Of that like that we, we did on a tablet. I mean, no. It's just like you learn to read a book. It's it's cool. It's exciting. So you think technology hurts our creativity, our playtime creativity? Um, yes, actually. Uh, uh, we succumbed a little bit and let our daughter uh, play with Minecraft. And uh, and because you know every, all the kids are talking, about, all right, fine, go ahead, you know. So just so you can, uh, you know, talk to your, your your classmates, and you know, she so but she got sucked in, but it was fortunately for a very short time, and she's over it. But uh, but she got sucked in, and, and, and my wife said to me, it's like, oh, I can totally see why you know girls are outpacing boys in 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 you know in learning test scores in college, you know, entrance and, and, and just like in college graduation because, you know, the boys are getting sucked into computer games and, and it's a time sink. Yes, right. Yes. It is we a know this time for adults, sink. not just and for kids. And I mean, I mean, yes, yes, it helps you with certain spatial skills and, and moving how to, knowing how to work a mouse. Great, you know, that you, you can go operate a machine. Oh, the opposite. But um, I, I, I don't, they're tools. Yes, they're tools. They're okay. tools. And I, they're I wonderful say, tools. Well, I don't, I don't know about the games because I'm not a gamer, so I, don't, I, I, won't say, I won't say anything about that, but I have to say that the creativity in our chef's meetings is always enhanced by technology because we all be there just throwing out ideas and somebody's on their phone pulling up something that then adds something to the conversation. The accessibility, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll agree with you there. The accessibility is just amazing to me that we could do, or I could be writing a recipe and I'm stuck with something and I just need to have a list of herbs. <laughs> and so I just go, I, I go on my phone and write list of herbs. <laughs> so I come up with this stuff and it's like, I go down it. Oh, oh yeah, that's the, the one. one. That's the one that's right for this recipe. And then I'm right on to the next stage. So accessibility to me is amazing. And I can work so much faster than I ever was able to work. So in if the you're past. using it as a tool, which yes. you are, then it's great. Yes. If you're using it as a diversion, it's a time sink. Yes, I agree with that. So, I mean, so yeah, it can be gr a great thing. And, and I use it, you know, for research. You know, I mean, I'm sure like Sarah uses it for research all the time, just like find out how do I know this detail without having to take a week on a, on a steamer. I always wonder about what NSA is thinking about all the websites that I go to, like the anarchist cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> the anarchist cookbook is a favorite. Attic. 
So you can, you know, if you want, you can just come over so, and yeah, flip through. Yeah, I was writing a short story where somebody was making a homemade bomb using a furnace, newspaper, and ammonia. And oh, they're tracking you, Sarah. Yeah. They're tracking you. What are the five things every person should keep in their kitchen? Ooh. I think we're going to be on opposite ends of the spectrum here. But please, please, Carrie, start. And I hope you like her five things, because that's what you're going to be cooking with. Okay. I, I, always, I always get nervous when they say five things, because I'm hoping you always have salt and olive oil. Yeah, yeah. And okay. Let's okay. hope for the basics. Yeah, okay. But okay. my five things, um, I went on a big health kick. So in my house, I have skim milk, cottage cheese, Mandarin oranges. Good luck, people. Good luck. Good luck. I always want somebody to come to my house and say they can make a meal within my refrigerator. Because uh, I have yogurt and tons of wine and champagne. So I, I would say the five things. I, I need um, lemon. Uh, I need a good ribeye. Garlic. Um, olive oil. And I love fennel. The oh, fennel's one of my fennel, favorites. Fresh fennel? And fresh fennel. Fresh fennel, Bob. So what would you say? I'm curious. And then I'm also curious what you two would say, but yes. Okay, so for me, I would start off I would start off with beans because to me I can't leave I can't live without beans. And they could be canned beans, they could be dry beans, depending on how much time you want to invest in all this. But I'm I say I always have canned beans on my on my shelf at home because I don't always have two hours to cook a pot of beans. Okay, so beans, that's number one. Um, the second forgot to bring them home from the And I forgot to bring them home from the <laughs> That's so true. Okay, my 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 next thing that I always have to have, I, I, it's two things kind of together. Okay, um, it's either bacon or chorizo sausage. Okay. <laughs> So um, I know it's like a total slam dunk. You can just say everybody. I cannot cook without a cured pork product. Okay, yeah. it's a, to me cured pork is really it. Okay, now I I also have to have something that is citrusy, but my tastes go to lime, not to lemon. Carrie's goes to lemon because of her background. Mine goes to lime. So that would be number three in there. Um, I, I have to have chilies, um, but I would probably say that because my tastes run more toward dried chilies than fresh chilies, uh, not that I don't like fresh chilies, I do, but if I had to choose one, I would choose a can of chipotle chilies. Okay, so that's my number four. Because it's smoky and spicy, and it'll give me everything there. And then I would say that the, probably the, the last thing that I have to absolutely have would be some fresh cilantro in my refrigerator. Mm. Come on, some, can, I, can I have some applause yes, for cilantro? Yes, you can. Okay. What about you two? So I would add <laughs> sriracha to that. I, I what add that. Like <laughs> peanut butter, jelly, <laughs> mac, <Yeah>. cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Those are two. Uh, that's, that's, that's four. Bread. And beer. And beer. <laughs> Sarah? But Crime Spree <clears throat> magazine just sent out a little questionnaire. They asked, what, is, what will you always find in my refrigerator? And I wrote back and said, you will always find horseradish because I buy a fresh jar every year for Passover, put it on the Seder plate, put it back in the refrigerator. <laughs> Next Passover comes around, I throw out that jar and buy a new jar. <laughs> but, um, That's perfect. I guess what I, there's a lot of yogurt in my refrigerator yes, too, too, and I use yogurt instead of making sauces. And now, please, I'm, this is embarrassing. So they're not listening to me, but. Um, so mushrooms are like one of my favorite foods and Mushrooms, kale, broccoli. I saute the mushrooms. That is I put so in, healthy. I it put is. in. I know it's boring, isn't it? <laughs> and then, um, and then I pour in some whole milk yogurt instead of making a sauce. And no, um, that's good. That's, that's super good. Uh, I do the same thing. I think it's delicious. Um, and that's my lazy uh. woman's dinner. Oh. Wow, very good no, for you. Good. Very, one word answers. Favorite junk food down the line. Mm. It's a compound word, chips and salsa. Yay, chips and salsa. I don't even think of that as junk food. It. That's how like, low my junk food is. Your favorite junk food? <clears throat> um, tortilla chips. What? That's not even junk food. It is? Food. OK. Well, it's got corn. I don't know. That's corn We're talking chips. snack okay. food. OK, snack food. Favorite, favorite junk food snack? Gummy bears. Ooh, 
Ooh, yummy. I'll go with that. Yes? Donuts, donuts, donuts. <laughs> I'll say peanut brittle. Okay, that's our show. It's been great to have you here. I want to